It was 26 years ago when a man from India, his name is Manny Manathan, he decided to do what he could to accomplish world peace. It was in 1989 then when Mr. Manathan decided to condemn terrorism by walking backwards everywhere he went, regardless of where he is, whether he's at home or, or at work or, or somewhere out on the streets. You can find Manny. He's looking over his shoulder in order to see where he's going so that he can continue to move forward as he walks backwards. Unfortunately, what this man is unable to see is his attempt to achieve world peace is completely failing because the world's still falling apart. Now, as we consider the way in which Manny Manathan has to, has to look backwards in order to see where he's headed, I believe that it's even more important for every Christian to take some time looking backwards as well. Uh, not to walk backwards, but, but so that we can see actually where this world is headed. In other words, we must engage in what I like to call retrospective eschatology. We need to look backwards in order to see the future. And for the sake of clarity, it'll help you to know that retrospective eschatology refers to the art of looking back at, at the end time prophecies found in God's word so that we can understand what's going to be happening in the future. And that's precisely what we're going to do here in our study today. Now, I'll remind you that it was in our last study when we kicked off this series that I've titled Retrospective Eschatology. And in this series, we're considering how the Lord is going to deal with the enemies of Israel during the last days. Here in this second installment of this series, we're going to learn, first of all, that retrospective eschatology will help us to see the Lord's prophetic warning for Edom's occupation. Secondly, we'll learn that retrospective eschatology will help us to see the Lord's prophetic promise for Edom's desolation. And thirdly and finally today, we'll learn that retrospective eschatology will help us to see the Lord's prophetic plan for Edom's annihilation. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 49, because here we find the prophet Jeremiah, he's presenting the prophetic word of God against the Edomites. As you make your way to Jeremiah 49, I want to set the stage for our text today by reminding you that it was in our last study when we examined the first six verses of this chapter. And during that study, we learned about the way in which the Lord is planning to deal with the Ammonites during the last days. We saw how this plan includes Ammon's retribution, Ammon's reduction, and Ammon's restoration. Now, here in our text today, we're going to learn about the way in which the Lord is planning to deal with the Edomites. But this is our focus. If you would look with me, we're going to begin reading at verse 7. There Jeremiah writes, Against Edom, thus says the Lord of hosts, Is wisdom no more in Teman? Has counsel perished from the prudent? Has their wisdom vanished? Flee, turn back. Dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Dedan. For I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him, the time that I will punish him. Now here in the opening verses of this chapter, we find the Lord, he's sending the prophet Jeremiah to present a prophecy against the people of Edom. And it'll first help us to know that the land of Edom was located in that area which we now refer to as southern Jordan. But before the borders of Jordan were drawn up by Winston Churchill in 1921, the ancient nation of Edom was actually located in this mountainous territory of land, which extended from the head of the Gulf of Aqaba, which is that northern gulf of the, uh, of the Red Sea, and it extended from, from there to the foot of the Dead Sea. And so it, it took over all that land between those two seas. It's also interesting to note that the Edomites, well, these are actually the descendants of Jacob's twin brother, Esau. I'll remind you that Esau was that profane person who sold his birthright as the firstborn son for one morsel of food. As a result, his twin brother, Jacob, he was born second, and he ended up receiving the treasured birthright from his father, Isaac. And afterwards, Jacob ended up being renamed Israel, and he became the father of Israel's 12 tribes. And as for Esau, well, 
his father Isaac promised him that his descendants would end up living by the sword, which simply means that the descendants of Esau would become warmongers. Not only that, but Isaac also told Esau that they would become the servants of Israel for a time, and then they would eventually break Israel's yoke from their neck. And this was certainly the case during the days of the Babylonian captivity. As a matter of fact, after the people of Judah were carried away as the captives of Babylon, the Edomites, they ended up moving into the land that belonged to Judah. And at that point in time, the land of Judah, well, it became known as Edom, or in the Greek, Idumea. Well, the Lord God of Israel already knew that the Edomites would eventually go in and possess this portion of the promised land. And so here in our text today, we find the Lord. He's questioning the wisdom of this decision before it actually happens. He's questioning the wisdom of this decision for these Edomites to go and occupy Judah. And as, if you would, look with me there at verse 7, because here we find that question. The Lord asks, is wisdom no more in Teman? Has counsel perished from the prudent? Has their wisdom vanished? In other words, the Lord was telling these people who were actually famous for their great wisdom, he's telling them that their decision to go and dwell in Judah would be an extremely unwise one. He's saying it's not going to be smart for you guys to make this move. And not only that, but there in verse 8, we should notice again where the Lord encouraged them to quickly return to their land by declaring this. He says, flee, turn back. Dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Dedan, for I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him the time that I will punish him. More simply put, the Lord was encouraging the Edomites to to run and hide and and, and, and to try to escape the punishment that would eventually come upon them for their unacceptable occupation of Judah. Unfortunately for them, they ignored this prophetic warning from the Lord. And with that being the case, the Lord was promising to punish Esau the descendants of Esau. And listen, this was not only true for the Edomites who were living in Judah during the days of the Babylonian captivity, but this is also true for those Edomites who are living in the promised land during the days before Christ's second coming. Now, this is our focus. If you would hold your place here in the book of Jeremiah and turn with me to Psalms chapter 83. As you make your way to, to, to the 83rd Psalm, I, I want to take a moment to consider the identity of the modern-day Edomites. In order to do so, I should first remind you that we actually find the descendants of Esau living in the land of Judah during the days of Jesus. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was born, Herod the Great was the king over Judah. And it's important for us to remember that Herod Well, this was the son of an Edomite man named Antipater, who was the governor of Idumea. What this means is that there was an Edomite king over Judah at the time of Jesus' birth. And remember, Herod the Great, uh, he was the king who had all the male children of Bethlehem under a certain age slaughtered after meeting with those wise men from the east who came to worship the baby Jesus. It was a descendant of Esau who attempted to stop the Messiah from becoming the king of the Jews. And listen, this Edomite rule over Israel didn't stop with Herod the Great. As a matter of fact, Herod the Great's sons and grandsons, they they continued to rule over the nation of Israel all the way until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., And at that time, the Romans came in and they they killed and captured the Israelites as well as the Edomites who were living in this area. Many were sold as slaves. And and listen, 40,000 Edomites were set free by Caesar who allowed them to just go wherever they wished. Where did they go? Well, I believe most of them stayed right there in that area of southern Judah where they had settled. And seeing how the territory of Idumea was still recognized in 135 A.D., then it's safe to say that most of those who were freed from from Caesar, they remained right there in southern Judah. Now, in order to make a 21st century connection, because there's there's a lot of stuff that happens between the 1st century and the 21st century, but in order to make this connection between those 1st and 2nd century Edomites and the 21st century people in this area, I want to consider... Uh, a prophecy found here in the 83rd Psalm. So if you would look with me, beginning at verse 1, here we find a seer by the name of Asaph, and here's what he declares. Do not keep silent, O God, 
Do not hold your peace, and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites, Gebal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot, Selah. Now here in this prophecy, we find Asaph. He's presenting us with this confederacy of nations which we've never seen before. We've never seen this group of nations working together in this way. And so we know it's still yet future tense. And we see this group of nations joining together with the singular purpose of wiping the nation of Israel off the map. Now I'll remind you that it was in our last study when we considered the role of the Ammonites and the Moabites in this battle. We considered how the children of Lot took their part in this confederacy. But now here in our study today, I want to draw your attention to that to the beginning of verse 6 there where Asaph mentions the tents of Edom and Ishmaelites. It'll help us to know that the word tents here, it could refer to a military encampment. It could refer to a military tents, but it could also refer to a refugee camp. And seeing how all of these militaries are working together, but only the tents of the Edomites and the Ishmaelites are mentioned, then I would assume that it's talking about refugee camps and not military tents. In light of this, it seems like this confederacy of nations is going to occur during a time when the descendants of Esau and Ishmael are both living in refugee camps. And just as the Lord revealed through Asaph, there are in fact refugee camps in this area of Hebron, because that's part of the West Bank, there are refugee camps right there in this area, precisely the area of Judah, which was originally occupied by the Edomites during the time of the Babylonian captivity. From this, it seems logical to conclude then that the descendants of Esau and Ishmael are both found within the people group that are currently referred to as the Palestinians. As you already know, these Palestinian refugees are currently occupying that land that rightly belongs to Israel. Therefore, this prophecy found in Psalm 83, it reveals a confederacy of nations made up of Edomites and Ishmaelites, as well as the descendants of Moab, the Hagarites, Gebal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, with the inhabitants of Tyre and Assyria. A confederacy of all these nations which surround the land of Israel, these nations will eventually commit themselves to wiping Israel off the face of the map so that the Palestinians can continue to occupy the land that they've claimed for themselves. Unfortunately for them, this confederacy of nation, nations, it's failing to apply retrospective eschatology to the prophetic word of God. If they would do that, then they would know that this confederacy is going to fail. But they're not. They're, they're not looking to these scriptures. They're not looking backwards to these Old Testament prophecies in order to understand what's going to happen in the future. And as a, re as a result, they're failing to grasp that these Palestinian refugees are the ones who are actually occupying Israel's land. Not only that, but these nations are also failing to grasp the promise that God made when he told the Edomites to flee, turn back, and dwell in the depths because he was about to bring the calamity of Esau upon him at the time when he pours out this perfect punishment upon them. Simply put, the, the Lord's promise to punish the Edomites for their occupation of Israel, it still stands. And while it was partially fulfilled at the time of the Babylonian captivity, and while it was, again, partially fulfilled by Rome, it will be completely fulfilled in the future. That being the case, retrospective eschatology helps us to see how the nation of Israel will experience an Edomite occupation during the last days, and we certainly see that happening today. Not only that, but retrospective eschatology also helps us to see that this occupation, it will result in Edom's 
desolation. And with this as our focus, let's turn back to Jeremiah chapter 49. Because here we find the Lord, he's describing the desolation which would come upon the Edomites. If you would look with me, beginning at verse 9. There the Lord declares, if grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleaning grapes? If thieves by night, would they not destroy until they have enough? But I have made Esau bare. I have uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His descendants are plundered, his brethren and his neighbors, and he is no more. Leave your fatherless children, I will preserve them alive. And let your widows trust in me. For thus says the Lord, Behold, those whose judgment was not to drink of the cup have assuredly drunk. And are you the one who will altogether go unpunished? You shall not go unpunished, but you shall surely drink of it. For I have sworn by myself, says the Lord, that Basra shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse. And all its cities shall be perpetual wastes. Now here in these verses we find the Lord describing the desolation which would come upon the descendants of Esau and according to the Lord here the Edomites would eventually be pushed out of the promised land and, and they would return to the caves and to the mines of Edom in an attempt to hide from their enemies. Unfortunately for them the Lord was promising to uncover their secret places so that their wives might become widows and so that their children might know the true and living God. Now, portions of this prophecy have already been fulfilled. And yet, retrospective eschatology would lead us to still look for a future fulfillment. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me again there at the end of verse 13, because there again the Lord declares, I have sworn by myself that Basra shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse, and it's all, all its cities shall be perpetual wastes. Without debate, this was partially fulfilled during the time when the Babylonians came in and, 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 and the years after that, we, we, we've seen the cities of this area become wasted and, and, and desolate. And yet, here in the 21st century, well, we still find cities throughout this area of Basra. As a matter of fact, there's currently a city in southern Jordan named Bazaria, which is adjacent to the ruins of Basra. There's just another city built up right next to the ruins of Basra. And therefore, this prophecy about the perpetual ruins of this region, well, it hasn't been completely fulfilled. That being the case, we should also expect the next three verses in our text to, to also be fulfilled in the future. And with this is our focus. Look with me, beginning there at verse 14, because there Jeremiah writes, I have heard a message from the Lord, and an ambassador has been sent to the nations, gather together, come against her, and rise up to battle. For indeed, I will make you small among nations, despised among men. Your fierceness has deceived you, the pride of your heart, O you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, who hold the height of the hill, Though you make your nest as high as the eagle, I will bring you down from there, says the Lord. Here in these verses we find the Lord. He's continuing to present a prophecy against those Edomites who will eventually flee to the clefts of the rock. Since he also mentions a nest as high as the eagle, well, I can't help but to think about the lost city of Petra. And as I say Petra, I realize that you might be thinking about that cheesy glam rock band, uh, from the 80s, but uh, that's, that's not who I'm talking about. I'm referring to this lost city of Petra, which was carved into the rose-colored rock of Edom's clefts. Chances are this is exactly where the Edomites will try to hide on the day that the Lord brings their punishment. What's even more interesting is that there's a structure in this lost city of Petra. It's known as the treasury. If you've ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, then you've seen a film of this incredible Oedipus. But what you might not know is that we find the remnants of four stone eagles at the very tippy top of this carved out castle. And with that being the case, I can't help but to wonder if Jeremiah may have been referring to the treasury there in Petra prior to it even being created. He presents this prophecy about their hiding place being in the cleft of this rock, which, uh, you know, he talks about this nest as high as the eagle and that they would hide there and we can't say for certain if this is what he was referring to. But what we do know is that the nation of Edom, they're eventually going to become a desolation as they try, try to escape 
uh, the punishment of their enemies. And as we, can, can you, uh, as we continue to, to, to use retrospective eschatology to understand the desolation that will occur there in Edom, we discover that this desolation of Edom is caused by the members of their own confederacy, and that's interesting to me. But this is our focus. If you would hold your place here in the book of Jeremiah and turn with me to the little book of Obadiah. I'd like you to turn to Obadiah chapter 1. There we find the Lord shedding more light on this end time prophecy. And as you make your way to Obadiah 1, I want to point out that Obadiah was a prophet who is believed to have come along towards the end of Jeremiah's ministry. And it appears to me that the Lord was giving the same prophetic word to Jeremiah and to Obadiah about the people of Edom. The Lord was giving them the same exact prophetic message so that they might understand what his plan was for them. With this in mind, if you would look with me there at Obadiah chapter 1, we're going to begin reading at verse 1. There we read the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. You who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. If thieves have, had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be cut off. Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If grape gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? Oh, how Esau shall be searched out, how his hidden treasure shall be sought after. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. Will I not say in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Here in this prophecy we see how the Lord was revealing the same warning to the descendants of Esau that he had presented through the prophet Jeremiah. Much of this prophecy is, is almost word for word to what Jeremiah had revealed. At the same time, I should also point out that the Lord presented more details here in this prophecy about the desolation of Edom. As a matter of fact, notice with me again there in verse 7 where the Lord told the Edomites that all the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. Now, some scholars suggest that this was fulfilled entirely by the Babylonians. However, I would point out that it was actually the Nabetans who eventually pushed Edom out of their land and not Nebuchadnezzar. That being the case, the fulfillment of this prophecy about Edom's desolation, it, I believe it's still yet future tense seems likely to me that there's coming a day when those Palestinians who come from the lineage of Esau will find themselves fleeing Israel in order to seek refuge there in the lost city of Petra, which is in the clefts of the mountains of Edom. As they do, I believe that the Edomites will find themselves being betrayed by their confederacy, uh, which was defined back in Psalm 83. I believe that that confederacy of nation will, for some reason, turn on the Edomites. And at that point in time, their allies will lay a trap for them and prevail against them so that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by this slaughter. If you'll allow me to speculate a little bit more about this battle that results in the desolation of Edom, I'd like to point out that the mountains of Edom, they're located directly between the Gulf of Aqaba and the land of Israel. If a scenario like the 1967 war occurs, then it seems likely to me that the confederacy of Arab nations described in the 83rd Psalm could end up blocking the Gulf of, of Aqaba in an attempt to prevent free access to Israeli ships. It's possible that Israel might respond to this act of aggression. And in this, the Edomites could end up being wiped out as the IDF battles against those Arab nations who are seeking to wipe Israel off the map. It's speculation, but it's plausible. 
from all this, we see then that retrospective eschatology. It sees how it helps us to see how, how the nation of Israel it's going to experience an Edomite occupation in the last days, as we see right now. And not only that, but retrospective eschatology helps us to see that this occupation will result in Edom's desolation as some sort of battle breaks out there in the land of Edom. Finally, we should consider how retrospective eschatology, well, it also helps us to see that this desolation, it will eventually culminate in Edom's annihilation. And with this as our focus, I'd like you to turn back to Jeremiah chapter 49. Because here we find the Lord, he's describing the annihilation of the Edomites. And if you would look with me, I'd like to begin reading at verse 17. There the Lord declared, Edom also shall be an astonishment. Everyone who goes by it will be astonished and will hiss at all its plagues. As in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, says the Lord, no one shall remain there, nor shall a son of man dwell in it. Here in these verses, we find the Lord comparing the desolation of Edom to the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'll remind you that when the Lord decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he did it with brimstone and fire from the heavens so that both cities were completely annihilated. In light of this comparison, I can't help but to wonder if the final annihilation of Edom occurs as the Lord returns to destroy those nations who attempted to destroy the people of God. And I do believe that there's good reason to believe that. In order to further grasp the details surrounding this annihilation, if you would look with me beginning at verse 19, because there Jeremiah writes, Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the floodplain of the Jordan against the dwelling place of the strong, but I will suddenly make him run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? For who is like me? Who will arraign me? And who is that shepherd who will withstand me? Here in this verse, we find a prophecy uh, which can be a little bit confusing. And to explain why it's a little confusing, if you would notice again there where Jeremiah refers to a he who comes up from the plains of the Jordan. And, and not only that, but there's a her who's being protected. And there's this chosen man who is appointed over her. I, I'll tell you, I went and read a bunch of commentators on this verse so that I could get a better understanding of it. And I was even more confused after I read several commentators, because none of them agree on what this verse means. I would like to spend time going through each of those commentators and what their point of view is, but we don't have time for that today. And so I'd like to just spend our time presenting you with my take on these verses. And again, it's my take. I personally believe that the he who comes up from the floodplain of the Jordan is a reference to the Edomites. I believe that this is them fleeing from their refugee camps and back into their lands. One reason why I believe that the he is the nation of Edom is based on the fact that the last subject mentioned in our text is Edom. It's there in verse 17. From this, it seems clear to me that, the, that this reference to the days when the Edomites uh, will, will flee from, from their refugee camps, I believe that that's what this is talking about. The Edomites who took control of southern Judah will be pushed out of the, the, the floodplain of the Jordan. Now, if that's the case, then the her found in verse 19 would be a reference to Israel. If the he is Edom, then the her is Israel. And, and there's good reasons to believe that as well. But since the children of Israel uh, were already out of their land when the Edomites originally moved into Judah, then I, again, I'm led to believe that this is a scenario that is still yet future tense. If the he is Edom and the her is Israel, then the time period is still yet to come. That being the case, we should notice again there in the middle of verse 19 where we learn that the Lord will suddenly make him run away from her. In other words, if I understand this correctly, then the Lord was promising to take and, and make these Edomites flee from the Israelites suddenly. And we should notice that this withdrawal would be caused by the protection of some appointed man. But then who is this appointed protector and how will he cause the Edomites to suddenly flee? Well, in order to answer this question, if you would hold your place here in the book of Judges, and let's turn back to the little book of Obadiah. As you make your way again to the book of Obadiah, I should take a moment to point out that there are many prophecies in the Old Testament that point to the day of the Lord. Anytime you find yourself reading a prophecy and it mentions the day of the Lord, I want to help you to understand what we're talking about. You see, when we consider everything that the Bible says about the day of the Lord, we 
quickly discover that the day of the Lord is that day when the Lord returns to destroy the nations who set out to destroy Israel. Those nations who attempt to destroy Israel in that final battle, uh, they'll find themselves on a specific day attempting to fight the anointed and appointed protector of Israel. And here in this little book written by the prophet Obadiah, we find one of these prophecies about the day of the Lord, and it points us to that day when the Lord will will return to protect his people. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me beginning there at verse 10, there the Lord declares, for violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you. Now, remember, this is a prophecy against the Edomites. And so it's a prophecy against the descendants of Esau for the way that they treated Esau's brother Jacob. He says, you shall be cut off forever. In that day, verse 11, that you stood on the other side in the day that strangers carried captives his forces, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. But you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near, As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. For as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord rebuking the Edomites for the way that they mocked the Israelites during the days when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem. But then beginning there at verse 15, we find this prophecy pointing from those things that happened during the Babylonian captivity, and now it's pointing to this prophecy about the day of the Lord, when all the nations of the world will be judged. This prophecy begins to talk about the day when holiness will be set up there on Mount Zion. And it's at that point in time when the earthly kingdom of Edom will be annihilated. It will be as stubble as though it never existed. What this means then is that there's not only coming a day when the Edomites will be pushed out of the west bank of Israel, but but there's also a coming a day when the descendants of Esau will be punished through the complete destruction of their nation. And remember this final annihilation of the nation of Edom, it's going to occur on the day of the Lord, when the anointed protector comes to save the people of Israel. And with this as our focus, I want to take a moment to identify this anointed protector. And so if you would, let's turn back to Jeremiah chapter 49. And look with me there at verse 20. There Jeremiah writes, Therefore hear the counsel of the Lord that he has taken against Edom and his purposes that he has proposed against the inhabitants of Teman. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their dwelling places desolate with them. The earth shakes at the noise of their fall. At the cry its noise is heard at the Red Sea. Behold, he shall come up and fly like an eagle and spread his wings over Basra. The heart of the mighty men of Edom in that day shall be like the heart of a woman in birth pangs. Here in the final verses of our study today, we find the counsel of the the Lord against Edom, and we learn that the Lord has not only promised the desolation of Edom, but he's also promised the annihilation of this nation, which set out to claim the promised land for themselves. 
And here in these verses, we learn that the cry of these people will be heard from the city of Teman, which is by the Red Sea, all the way to Basra, which is by the Dead Sea. So throughout the whole region of Edom, uh, these people are going to be heard crying out on this day. And while this prophecy was partially fulfilled during the days of Jeremiah and Obadiah, there's still yet a future fulfillment which is going to happen on the day of the Lord. As a matter of fact, notice again there in verse 22, there we read about this man who will come up and fly like the eagle. It says that he's going to spread his wings over Basra. And on that day, the heart of the mighty men of Edom will be like the heart of a woman in birth pangs. Now, many commentators, they rightly point out that this prophecy was partially fulfilled during the days of Nebuchadnezzar. And yet there's good reason for us to believe that this prophecy won't be completely fulfilled until the day of the Lord. In order to prove my point, if you would turn with me to the book of Isaiah, I'd like you to turn to Isaiah chapter 63. And the reason why is because it's in Isaiah 63 where we find the prophet Isaiah, he's revealing more details about this anointed protector who comes up through Edom. And as we consider Isaiah's prophecy here in Isaiah 63, I believe that the identity of this person, this appointed protector, I believe that this identity will be abundantly clear. But this is our focus. If you would look with me there at Isaiah 63, we're going to begin reading at verse 1. There Isaiah asks, Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel traveling in the greatness of his strength. Now we find the answer to the question. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Here's the next question. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? Here's the answer. I have trodden the winepress alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. Here in these verses, we find the prophet Isaiah describing the anointed protector who was appointed to save Israel from the Edomites. And we discover that this Savior, there's coming a day when this Savior is going to tread the Edomites under his foot in his anger on the day of vengeance, which is also the day of the Lord. You see, the day of vengeance is also the year of the redeemed. And from this, it seems evident to me here that this is a reference to the second coming of our Savior, Jesus. There's coming a day when the Lord returns to the earth and he will begin his battle against the enemies of Israel and this battle begins in Edom. It's at this point in time when the nation of Edom will be annihilated. It will become a stubble as though it never existed. And yet on that same day, the redeemed of the Lord will rejoice. Now as we begin to wrap up our study today, I want to point out that Edom's current occupation of Israel is eventually going to result in the desolation that, that occurs when Israel pushes them out of their refugee camps and back into the land of Edom. And, and then after the times of, of, the, of the, the great tribulation, the Lord is going to return on the day of the Lord. And, and at that point in time, he's going to judge the nations of the world. And according to Jeremiah, this judgment will begin there in Edom as the Lord sets out to save his redeemed people. And listen. Listen. Not only will he annihilate the nation of Edom, but he'll also annihilate every nation that attempted to destroy the nation of Israel. That's what the Lord has revealed. On the day of the Lord, he is going to destroy and annihilate every nation that attempted to destroy the apple of his eye. From this we see then that retrospective eschatology, it it helps us to see that the Lord's day of vengeance is eventually going to arrive. There's coming a day when the Lord will return and wage war against his enemies. And on that day, it's not going to be little baby Jesus in a manger. 
It's not going to be sweet baby Jesus meek and mild. It is going to be the commander of the Lord's army returning to wage war against the enemies of Israel. He will not spare them. He will trample them underfoot so that his garments become stained with their blood. He's going to, as John says in the book of Revelation, tread them under his feet in the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. It's at this point in time when the King of Kings will establish his throne in Jerusalem. And he will begin to rule the world with a rod of iron for a thousand years. But listen, he's not going to wait until that day to see who will submit to him. That day is today. Today the Lord is giving us the opportunities to submit to the King of Kings. And our decision about Jesus will determine whether the day of the Lord is a day of vengeance or a day of redemption. You see, it's going to be that for everyone. The day of the Lord is going to be the day of vengeance against the enemies of God and the day of redemption for the people of God. And your decision about who Jesus is in your life has everything to do with what side of the coin that coin falls on. In light of this truth, I would encourage you, if you haven't yet, submit yourself to King Jesus. Because though he's not ruling and reigning over our planet right now, there's coming a day in, I believe, the very near future when he will return to establish his kingdom. Are you his enemy? Are you his servant? Will that be a day of vengeance for you? Or a day of rejoicing? That being the case, I encourage you, submit yourself to King Jesus so that that might be a day of rejoicing. So that you can rejoice with your king as he takes control of this planet. No more presidential elections. No, no more horrible governments. No more nations that are leading this world to hell in a handbasket. But King Jesus will rule and reign with a rod of iron. And his enemies will be brought into submission and punished for their crimes. I look forward to that day, and if you are a Christian, then I encourage you to recognize that we have this opportunity to let the world know that that day is coming. There's a lot of things that would grab our attention and, and cause us to spend a whole lot of time doing a whole lot of stuff, but I'm here to tell you that the best thing we can do with the time that we have right now is to let everyone know Jesus is coming back. He will return. And on that day, his redeemed will rejoice as he takes his vengeance against those nations who sought to destroy his chosen people.